Hey, thanks for joining me today for this episode on the hero's journey. I first learned about the hero's journey probably about 12 years ago, uh, maybe a couple of years after I really started writing for a publication. And to me, it was kind of mind blowing. It really opened my eyes to the way to structure a story for me. It works for me. And I want to start with a caveat saying that ultimately you have to figure out what kind of story structure works for you. A lot of people are loyal to Blake Snyder's 15 Beats. Some are three-act structure people. Some are four-act structure people. And others are Hero's Journey. Now, I like to look at the Hero's Journey and the way that it overlays with the three-act structure. I teach a class on this, and it's part of the Ready, Set, Write comprehensive course on the WriterSpark Academy learning platform, in fact. I don't think you can ever have too many examples of the hero's journey. Part of what I've done on Writer Spark Academy is to do hero's journey breakdowns. There's a hero's journey database with the breakdown of different movies in particular, because that's a very easy way to look at the hero's journey and to really internalize it and understand what it's about. So if you're interested in seeing more breakdowns of the hero's journey after today's talk, then head over to writersparkacademy.com where you will find that hero's journey database. Today, I want to give a quick overview of what the hero's journey is, and then I want to dive into an example using the movie Percy Jackson and the Lightning Thief. The hero's journey stems from Joseph Campbell's study of mythology and history and culture and the monomyth. And from there, Christopher Vogler, who wrote The Writer's Journey, based on Joseph Campbell's The Hero with a Thousand Faces, uh, Christopher Vogler took that and really created a playbook for Hollywood screenwriters. And it's still used today. In fact, Will Smith references it in his in his memoir or autobiography, Will, he talks about meeting Steven Spielberg and and, uh, trying to be convinced to do Men in Black and Steven Spielberg giving him a copy of The Hero with with a Thousand Faces and how it just was mind-blowing for Will Smith and changed the way that he looked at all the roles that he was going to take. It can be really, really powerful. Disney movies, Pixar movies, are very, very clear in following the hero's journey. So if you really want to study the hero's journey and really internalize it, really look at the elements, watch a bunch of Disney movies or a bunch of Pixar movies because they adhere to the steps really, really closely. But most movies do, actually. Most books do. Movies, again, I think are just easier to talk through because they're a little bit more universal. Um, Most people have an understanding of, you know, most of the Disney movies, for example, they may not have seen all of them, but they know of them. So anyway, going back to Christopher Vogler, he created this playbook for screenwriters and it's still used today. It is a roadmap. If you want to call it that, it is maybe a template. Some people might say it's a template. Really what it is, is a guide to taking your protagonist through the journey of your plot and creating a way for your character to have experiences that resonate with the people that are reading your book because they are human experiences. They're universal experiences that your hero is, is going through and the, the process, the steps that move the hero, the protagonist from the ordinary world where they begin to the new world and then to the resurrection, the moment where they are now heroic, is understood and accepted because we have been along for the ride and we have seen the obstacles that the protagonist has faced and we believe that they have earned their stripes as a hero by the end of the book or the movie. So let's take an example Let's look at Percy Jackson and the Lightning Thief. Now, this is a Disney-produced movie, and it's based on the Rick Riordan book, Percy Jackson and the Lightning Thief. And it 
follows a very clear hero's journey. I mean, it it's down to the minute almost, and it's very fun to start watching movies and realizing that you can actually look at your watch or set your timer and and see where those transitions happen. It's such a clear roadmap for the plot. So Percy Jackson begins with a scene between Zeus and Poseidon. And we learn that Zeus's lightning bolt has been stolen. And Zeus, for whatever reason, believes that Poseidon's son, which is Percy Jackson, is the one who stole this lightning bolt. And he gives Poseidon two weeks to get this lightning bolt back in order to avoid a complete war between the gods because they would have to choose sides between Poseidon and Zeus and, you know, the world would be in chaos and, you know, everything would end as we know it. And that's, you know, this is, this is a fantasy book, fantasy movie. So we simply accept that this mythology is real and these, these gods exist in our world. That's the setup for the ordinary world. And then we meet Percy Jackson, who is Poseidon's son although he doesn't know that yet. And we see him in school. We see him at home with his mother and his stepfather, who's not a nice guy. And we see him with his best friend, Grover. And uh, we learn that Percy has ADHD and dyslexia. And these are things that he feels hold him back. And he doesn't feel like he fits in in school for that reason. He doesn't belong there. And then we see him go to a museum. And at this museum, the words kind of rearrange themselves. And at first, it's difficult for him to, to decipher what it's saying. But then it, it's in Greek and, and it, he begins to understand it. His brain, as we learn later, is kind of pre-wired to understand Greek. So this dyslexia, we also learn later, is, uh, is one of his strengths. So right now he sees it as a weakness, but in reality, it's one of his strengths. At the museum... He has a teacher, Mr. Bruner, who takes him, takes all the students into the Greek Roman area. And they're talking about Greek mythology. And they talk about what a person is called if they are half mortal, half god, and they're a demigod. And this is kind of a, a quick foreshadow of what's to come. We know because we've seen that little clip between Zeus and Poseidon. So we know that Percy is this demigod, although we maybe didn't have a name for it at that point. But this is what he is. And so Mr. Bruner already is seen as a mentor. We then meet the first enemy, which is in the form of Miss Dodd, who is a substitute teacher who calls Percy aside and then turns into this monster before his eyes. And this is the first moment when Percy realizes that things are not as they seem, that the world as he knows it is not actually the way things are because he's a demigod and he's seen this monster just appear before his eyes up on the scaffolding and then she turns into this this creature that flies at him and this is when Mr. Bruner and Grover appear and Mr. Bruner is the one who gets this um, monster to go away and Percy learns it's a fury who's come to claim the lightning bolt that they think Percy stole Everybody thinks Percy has stolen this lightning bolt. So Mr. Bruner and Grover know that Percy is no longer safe, that that his whereabouts and his identity have been found out by the mythological monsters and the gods. He is no longer safe. So Mr. Bruner tells Grover to go home with Percy, warn Sally, Percy's mom, and they need to get out of there. They need to go to the camp. And that's what they call it, the camp. Grover tells Percy that he's his protector. Percy still doesn't know what's going on. And he, they get to the house and uh, the stepdad's being a jerk. And Grover tells Sally that they've got to go, that the jig is up basically. And Percy is not safe anymore. And out the door they go into the car and they're driving, driving, driving. And this is when Sally tells Percy about his parentage, who his father is. And at this point, I mean, Percy knows that things are not the way he thought. So he can accept, he just accepts that, okay, this is, this is really happening. And this God really does exist. And he's the son of this God. So they're close to the camp 
And suddenly there's a car accident because a creature, which is a minotaur, attacks, flips the car. They escape with their lives, but they're being chased by a minotaur. And Percy is able to defeat this creature with a weapon that Mr. Bruner had provided him earlier. But in the meantime, Sally vanishes. She's gone. And Percy doesn't know what's happened to her. He just assumes that she has died. He defeats the Minotaur, and then he and Grover literally cross the threshold into the new world. Okay, so all of that happens in 15 minutes, the first 15 minutes of the movie. That is his ordinary world. And then there's a call to adventure, and that's when Percy realizes that things are different than what he thinks, and then that he has to leave to this camp. And then there's a refusal of the call. Now, that doesn't come in the form of Percy refusing to go. It comes in the form of this Minotaur trying to stop them. So the refusal of the call can come in a lot of different ways. And I talk about that more in my class, but you know, you can refuse the call yourself or something can happen to make you refuse the call that's out of your control. And that's what happens with Percy for that first refusal. But ultimately, he does cross the threshold. And this is a literal crossing. He crosses from the ordinary world through the gates and into the camp. And this is a place that only demigods can go. His mother wouldn't have been able to pass through because she's mortal. So he literally crosses the threshold into this new world, which is Camp Half-Blood. Once there, he learns so many different things. So first of all, he learns who Grover is, that he's a satyr and that he's his protector. He's Percy's protector. He's a junior protector who has not earned his horns yet. So there's that. He learns who Annabeth is, which is Athena's daughter. He learns that Mr. Bruner is actually Chiron, who is a centaur. And he sees all of these other demigods, you know, in various stages of training throughout this camp. And he's just a bit overwhelmed. And then he learns about this, this um, kind of pergola that Poseidon built for him, knowing that someday he, Percy, his son Percy would be at this camp. And that is when Percy puts together that his father is actually Poseidon. And things start to make sense. The fact that he's always had this huge affinity for water is one connection that he has in particular to his father, to Poseidon. A short while later, it becomes clear to Percy, or Percy learns, that his mother actually is not dead. And that's because Hades comes to the camp in his fiery bigness and demands the lightning bolt, which Percy doesn't know anything about. And Hades says he will trade the lightning bolt for Percy's mother. And that's how he learns that his mother is actually still alive and being held captive in the underworld by Hades. This is his challenge now. Chiron wants him to to stay where he is and to go talk to Zeus and to proclaim his innocence and let Zeus handle it. Percy just can't do that. He has to set off and rescue his mother. And in true hero fashion, he's got some sidekicks. So Annabeth and Grover both go with him. Before that, they meet up with Luke, another of the demigods. He's the son of Hermes. And Luke provides Percy with a couple of things, a pair of shoes that have wings on it that belong to his father so he can fly, and also a shield, his favorite shield, and that's meant to protect Percy. So they, Percy accepts these gifts, and then the three, Annabeth, Grover, and Percy, head off on their adventure. What they're after are Persephone's pearls. Persephone is being held captive in the underworld by Hades. If you know the story of Persephone, you know that that she's there for most of the year and only allowed to come up during springtime. And this is when um, Demeter, her mother, lets the spring grow and everything because she's happy that her daughter is back. Persephone is being held against her will, essentially, but she's trapped in the underworld by Hades. She has placed these pearls throughout the world so that people can come and visit her and then they can get out again. They can come, but people can't get out of the underworld except with these pearls. And they just have to crush them, 
think about where they want to go, and then it's magic. They go to that place. So there are three pearls hidden in the United States, and so they have to go, Percy, Annabeth, and Grover have to go find these pearls in order to rescue Sally, Percy's mom, and get out of the underworld again. Think about the power of three. That's going to be a different talk at a different time, but the power of three is powerful because it speaks to our human nature again. If there was only one challenge that Percy had to face, that wouldn't be very fulfilling and we wouldn't think that he's heroic enough to now go and face Hades and rescue his mother. Two challenges would be better. Three challenges is great because we feel like, okay, he's actually earned this earned his heroism, and now he really has the tools to fight Hades. Because during these challenges, these three challenges, he's growing, he's changing. He's no longer this high school kid that he started as. He's growing into his demigodness, so to speak. They first have to go to Medusa's garden. Uma Thurman plays Medusa. She's brilliant. And that's where they get the first pearl. So Percy, with his wits, with his cleverness, realizes how to defeat Medusa. Then he thinks to take Medusa's head with them. And next they go to the Parthenon, knock off Parthenon in Nashville. And there they face the Hydra. And it is with Medusa's head that they're able to immobilize the Hydra. So again, Percy's wits and his cleverness is what saves them. So he's he's growing and he's learning and he's becoming better and coming into himself. The final place that they go is to Las Vegas, to the Lotus Hotel. And what they discover later is that they were in the lair of the Lotus Eaters for five days. So by the time they escape with the third pearl, they are down to just 24 hours before they have to get the lightning bolt back to Zeus, find the lightning bolt, get the lightning bolt back to Zeus and also save Percy's mom. They end up in the underworld. They were able to cross the river Styx and, you know, there's a, there's a whole lot of other stuff that takes place, you know, all of the little details, but they cross the river Styx and they get into the underworld Persephone ends up helping them. She doesn't want an all-out war between the gods because then she'll be stuck forever in the underworld. She doesn't want that. So she ends up helping them. And Percy then is able to go with his mother to take his mother. There was a whole battle. So during this battle, we think, oh, this, this is great. So he's going to win this battle, defeat Hades, get his mother, and go. All of this has been the road of trials. All of these different obstacles is the majority of your book or the majority of your movie. So the first 15 minutes was the ordinary world. The next hour, hour and 15 minutes is all of this, the road of trials and all of those obstacles and the enemies that your hero, your protagonist is facing. That leads to the central ordeal. In the three-act structure, this is still part of act two. This is like one of the major turning points, the last major turning point before the climax. We're not at the climax yet. You might think so. And we're kind of um, lured into believing that we're at the climax with this big with this big battle. But in fact, it is the central ordeal in the hero's journey. In this case, the lightning bolt is revealed. It has been hidden in the back of Luke's shield. So it's revealed that Luke, the son of Hermes, the, the guy who actually helped um, helped Percy by providing him with the shoes and the shield and the map to get to the underworld in the first place, was actually the lightning thief. And he stole the bolt. So now Percy really can put an end to the war before it happens by returning the bolt and he can save his mother. Again, Persephone helps incapacitates Hades for uh, temporarily. And then she sees that they only have three pearls. One pearl, one person. There are four of them. Percy, Sally, the mother, Annabeth, and Grover. Only three of them can leave because there's only three pearls. This is when it's really evident that every character is the hero of his or her own journey. Grover, the junior protector, who has not gotten his horns yet, is on his own journey. He's willing to sacrifice his life for Percy. He says that at one point. This is his moment. 
to be the ultimate protector. He volunteers to stay behind in the underworld, trapped forever, in order for Percy to rescue his mother and for Annabeth and Percy and Sally to go and return the lightning bolt to Zeus and stop the war before it happens. So Grover has fulfilled his own hero's journey. He has made that sacrifice and it's true to character because that's what he was meant to do. So he's fulfilled that journey. After the central ordeal and before the resurrection, there is the road back. They think they've won only to realize that they haven't. The road back reveals that there's another obstacle to fight. And in this case, it's the discovery that Luke is the bad guy. And when he shows up at the Empire State Building, that begins the resurrection. So the road back was very short-lived because that central ordeal was a false climax. It wasn't the full thing. It was the last turning point that leads to the resurrection or to the climax in that three-act structure. Percy and Sally and Annabeth do leave the underworld. They go to Olympus. Turns out the entrance to Mount Olympus is at the Empire State Building. So that's where they end up. And again, we think, great. All he has to do is go in to Olympus and return that lightning bolt. Except there's Luke who appears. Luke, who is the lightning thief. Luke, who wants the power and control. And he says earlier, that's a foreshadow, that the gods only care about themselves. And that's true for him as well. He wants the power. And he confesses to being the lightning thief. And he says there's no way that he's going to let Percy take that bolt and return it to Zeus before midnight, which is the ticking clock. So there's a big battle that ensues. Luke steals the lightning bolt from Percy and uses it against him. And it is in this moment, this is called the resurrection in the hero's journey. And it's called the resurrection because this is the moment in the book or the moment in the movie, the moment in the story when the protagonist is resurrected into a hero. So the protagonist is no longer that ordinary person that he or she was at the beginning of the story. No, now they are heroic. This is their moment. And this is the moment for Percy when he truly embodies his demigodness and he channels his father's power with the water. And that's ultimately how he defeats Luke is by breaking, like, you know, using his power to, um, to tap into the water towers. And then he harnesses the water and then throws it at Luke, defeating him. And then he's able to pick up the lightning bolt and carry on. And it's all very dramatic. Of course, this is the huge resurrection scene in the three act structure. It would be the climax. This is the last turning point the climax, the resurrection, whatever you want to call it. It's the end of the journey. And in the case of Percy Jackson, he gets the lightning bolt. He's able to go in the nick of time, two minutes to spare, to Mount Olympus through the portal. And then he and Annabeth are able to go into the council and return it and stop war from happening. And that's the end of the resurrection. So Percy was able to save the world and stop the war from happening between the gods in those last two minutes of the bulk of the story. Some of you might remember the story plot diagram from when you were in middle school. You recall there was the exposition at the beginning. That's where we get the setting and the characters. And then there's the rising action. And that's like climbing the roller coaster. And then you have the top of the roller coaster that is the climax. And then we have the falling action, which is the resolution. How steep that incline is depends on how many obstacles are going to be faced and how much time is left for that resolution. And in the case of the hero's journey, that's called the return with the elixir and the master of two worlds. In the case of Percy Jackson, it's about the last 10 minutes. He talks with his father. He understands what's happened. And now when he goes back to Camp Half-Blood, he goes back as a demigod. He doesn't go back as the high school kid he was when he started and when he first crossed the threshold. No, now he's proven his heroism and now he belongs and he feels like he belongs and he finally understands how he fits and where he fits. He's still the person he was before, but he is also this new person. And so that's why he's called the master of two worlds. You can't 
you can't forget about who you were. That's still part of you. But now you've grown and you've changed. And so you are this new version of yourself, master of two worlds. And that's what the return of the elixir is too. It's it's that success. There you have it. That is Percy Jackson and the Lightning Thief and Percy's Hero's Journey. It takes a while to really internalize these steps and to be able to see them, but I really highly recommend that you start watching movies and pay attention to the timing. Usually in an hour and a half movie, the ordinary world is going to be presented in the first 15 to 20 minutes or so. The next hour maybe a little bit more, is going to be the bulk of the story. That's the road of trials in a book that in a 200 page book, that means that the first 50 pages are the ordinary world. Then we cross into the new world, cross the threshold. The the next 100 pages or more are going to be the bulk of the story, the road of trials where all the obstacles are faced and we face the central ordeal and the road back. And then we have the last 50 pages that wraps up the return with the elixir and the master of two worlds. And it's the same in a movie. So we would have the last 15 minutes or 10 minutes, depending on the length of the movie, that's going to wrap everything up. It's really uncanny how closely movies follow that. And that's because of Christopher Vogler and the writer's journey and his sort of roadmap for the hero's journey that a protagonist should take. And this is true for action movies, for drama, for comedies. They all have a hero's journey. Once you start looking for it, you're going to see it. I encourage you to visit writersparkacademy.com. Check out the hero database there where there are other hero's journeys breakdowns that you can look at and again, start to internalize all of these different steps. I hope that this has helped explain or demonstrate the hero's journey. I know I had to see it in action a bunch of different times before I really, really got it. And now it is the way that I craft a novel and I follow that journey pretty, pretty carefully because to me, it really speaks to the human experience and it is what we as readers and we as movie viewers respond to. Because a hero has to earn their heroism. They have to earn that title. It doesn't just come to them magically. In order for a book to be fulfilling, for a movie to be fulfilling, we have to have that journey. If you ever get to the end of a book or to the end of the movie and you feel like "Mm, that just didn't do it for you, something was missing, chances are pretty good that there was not a complete hero's journey, that some elements were missing that prevented the hero from really growing into their heroism on that journey. So pay attention, start start looking for those journeys, and I think you'll be really surprised. I will be back with another hero's journey breakdown. I love to do them, and I hope that you'll join me. Thank you, YouTubers. Please subscribe to this channel. That would be great. I've got new content coming out, and I appreciate the follows. See you later. Happy writing.